We're continuing in our series in Titus. And if you've been with us either last week when we jumped back into the pastoral letters, or even before when we wrestled with First and Second Timothy, these three letters, the pastoral letters, are written by the Apostle Paul to two pastors, Pastor Tim and Pastor Titus, giving instructions for the nature of their work as pastor elders in their church. And there's a lot of insights we can glean as a church about what it means to be doing ministry and the nature and the health of a church. And really in the book of Titus, what you get in the, this text and the next couple are some exhortations addressing specific topics to get our church in order to be faithful. In fact, in many ways, what Paul is addressing here is, is, is he's giving something like a pregame talk to a coach. He's talking about what he assigned him to do and what the task is. And, and, and like a coach right before the game, he's giving an encouraging exhortation. Here's what we need to accomplish. Here's what we need to do. And he's talking about putting things in order. That's where he starts in verse 5. Getting things clean. In fact, you've heard the saying, going back for centuries is the saying, cleanliness is next to godliness. It's become a proverb of sorts, even though it's not in our Bible at all. In fact, it's been used since the Wesleyans started a long time ago in the church to speak about the nature of a personal life. But, but you could say that cleanliness in the church is important as well. Paul wants Titus to clean things up, to get things ordered so that ministry can happen. So I will, in the next few minutes, kind of go through this text with you. And what I think this text is saying is this, Paul commands that the church and its leaders should work to establish a clean church. And I'll show you just five ways in this text that a church cleans itself and makes sure it's in proper order. But before we do, let me just pray and ask God to minister through his word. Father, open our eyes that, me, that we may see the wondrous things in your law and help us to be shaped and formed by your truth and that the work of your Spirit, Father, would not just individually work in us, but that corporately you would make Hope Evangelical Free Church a clean church, rightly ordered for the sake of proper good work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first command that Paul gives is right there in the beginning of verse 5. Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that, here's the purpose, so that you might put what remained into order. Now you kind of wonder what was the context of the church in Crete. He literally left, Paul did, to go on the continuing missionary journeys, and he left a trusted ministry partner named Titus, with whom he had ministered for several years, and Titus had his, himself a good 20 years of various kinds of ministry. He left them in that church to pastor or shepherd that church. We know little about what was happening in the church in Crete. It would be kind of interesting to know what, was, what, what, what remained. What did he mean by that? But we do know, following what he says, that the way to put it in order is given by Paul. But to be honest with you, brothers and sisters, I'm not sure we need to even worry as much about what was going on in Crete, but to know that in God's providence and by his direction, this word is written for us too. That we need to put things in order. So we could say the first thing would be this, that a clean church will put things into order to make sure the church is healthy. We want to make sure it's healthy. We want to make sure it's functioning the way God wants it to function. And that might even just be a big topic in of itself, what that even means. But in, our, in the church series we went through just the last couple months, I, I gave you three things that it seems to me that King Jesus commands of his church. And those three things are that we are to love God, that we are to love neighbor, and we're to love one another. And so one way of knowing if we're properly ordered and aiming toward the right things is that those three things are part and parcel of everything that we're doing. Like every activity, every ministry, every, every encounter that we have as a church, we are trying to align our lives to minister in that way. Putting things into order almost sounds like the analogy that Vera was using for our kids about putting things back in the closet. I, I, literally, I walked into one of my son's room the other day and the dresser drawer was in front of the door. Now all the clothes were in the, dra in the drawer, but the drawer was out of the dresser sitting in front of the room. 
I'm like, what are you doing, boy? Well, it's in the drawer. Yeah, but the drawer's not in the dresser. So you want things structured right. You, you, you want to make sure that everything is happening so that the work that God is intended to do can happen. You want to make sure that there's proper oversight, which we'll talk about in a minute. You even want to have a culture that facilitates the right thing. We often hear people talk about the need for revival. We'll hear evangelists or preachers talk about that for our country or our world, and all of that is good and true. And there have been key revivals in the history of the church. I'm thinking of the second, first and second great awakenings that someone like Jonathan Edwards would write about. Or even I experienced the, 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 the remnants or impact or aftershock of a revival that happened at Wheaton College in 1995 when I, as a sophomore junior, was just on the road to Trinity. And students from Wheaton came and talked about this massive influx of people confessing their sins and writing themselves with, with God and, and, and changing the trajectory of their lives because God was at work. And God can do those miraculous things like a revival. But a word that maybe is more common and probably could be used more regularly is not revival per se, but revitalization. In fact, that's what you often hear pastors and writers say that a church needs to make sure they're revitalized. And that's just another word saying that they're healthy. There's life in them. Things have been put into order. So at least from the beginning of verse 5, we can see that one aspect of a clean church is that we make sure it's healthy, that everything is put in order, that from what we know from God's Word, we're doing and structuring things the way they're supposed to be. The second part of verse 5 gives us our second aspect of a clean church. A clean church will have an elder structure for leadership. Look at what Paul says at the end of verse 5. After talking about putting what remained in order, he says this, and do this, appoint elders in every town, i.e. every local church, as I directed you. So the first step in assuring a proper church is the establishment of pastor elders. That's the office, the two offices in the church, one that deals with the soul as the pastor elder, one that deals with the body, the physical needs of the church is the deacon. And the first thing the Apostle Paul commands, notice he uses the word, as I directed you, is the establishment of that office in the church. In fact, that word directed is the exact same word the Lord used to Moses when he was commanded to build the the tabernacle. So think of the church like a building with the office of pastor elder serving as the core support structure for the whole facility. Like you want to make sure those things are in place. A foundation is laid for the rest of the work and the rest of the structure. And we believe that the Lord raises up those individuals. In fact, he's assuming Titus will be able, notice he says appoint elders, to recognize their worthiness and calling to serve in this role. And we believe in our tradition that it's not even just someone like a Titus, let's just say someone like a bishop that would select those, but that the Spirit of God and the priesthood of all believers not only helps us select who should serve in that office, but actually that the congregation would appoint them. That's the your role as a member is so significant. You are facilitating a healthy church and a clean church by voting in individuals to serve in this office to represent you and to do the ministry of Christ. And you're empowering them as congregants. I think something that we've learned in recent years especially, but I think it is biblical in principle, is the importance of a plurality of elders. Notice even in verse 5, appoint elders in every town. Now he could be talking about individually, but it seems biblically that that plural refers to to every individual town, meaning a plurality of leadership is important. A plurality of, of elders avoids one person's limitations. Every person has strengths and weaknesses, abilities and things with which they struggle. But it also avoids the dangerous growth of power and even the evil of pride, that everyone should be accountable to somebody. And having a plurality of elders can help avoid that problem, allow for a checks and balances. There, Christianity Today is doing a podcast on a very famous, now-ended megachurch and very famous megachurch pastor. They're doing 12 episodes, and they've 
only released eight of them, and they are going viral. I mean, they're being listened to all over the place. And they're, they're basically a sad story of a downfall of a church that at one time had 15,000 people in numerous states and a pastor that was world-renowned for his celebrity status. And one of the things that one of the episodes revealed is that the only way he could make that work, to grow to that magnitude, is if he literally functioned like a general. There was nobody that would hold him accountable. There was nobody to whom he would report. When somebody challenged him, he would not only not receive the challenge, but remove them from any role or office. And the other elders involved were basically yes men, allowing him to have that power. Now, I'm not saying that any church couldn't make those mistakes, even with a plurality of elders, but if there's real checks and balances and accountability, there's a good chance that that doesn't happen. And we've seen that several times, even just in the Chicago area in the last couple years. When somebody, because giftedness, giftedness becomes valued more than character. And we love giftedness. And we want somebody who can move a room and draw in a crowd. And brothers and sisters, that is not, that is not how God designed it to work. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And we have to work like that, knowing full well that God is the one who works. So a second part of having a clean church is that we have a proper structure to avoid the kind of problems that some of our brothers and sisters in some of their churches have faced because of power and pride. A third is that a clean church will appoint elders, in my words, who respond to the gospel in word and deed. When Carly was reading that list in verses 6 through 8, you may remember those from when we talked about those in the letters to Timothy. Characteristics that are to reflect a life of an individual who is not only believing in Jesus as their Savior, but fully submitting to Him as their Lord. And those are scary phrases for any person involved in or applying for the office of pastor or elder to meet. I say that they are to be that such individuals are respond to the gospel and word and deed because every Christian needs to know that the Lord, even if they're leaders, even if they're in the office of pastor or elder, that they are under King Jesus. And they are under shepherds of the chief shepherd. And these qualifications, we don't need to spend more time on them now. If you're with us through the Timothy letters, we cover them in detail. But it reflects God's concern to align word and deed. Uh, let, let me put it this way. If, if the elder, the office of pastor elder serves as a foundational structure for the house in which God is to minister and people are to live, you don't want to use faulty materials. You wouldn't use rotted wood or improperly mix cement to make a structure. You'd want to make that the, the materials, that the quality of those materials, as best as you could deem, are of a caliber that it can support the weight and the force of the structure that people are going to live in. In the same way, those characteristics in verses 6 and 8, high as they are, are demanding that the quality of materials be tested and true. And when it is faulty, if it is a piece of rotten wood, it needs to be cut out and removed. As hard as that would be and as difficult for all sides, it needs to be removed because the overall structure and ultimately beyond the metaphor, the health of a church is at stake. Here's the fourth in verses 9 and 10. A, a clean church will be willing to have hard conversations and address difficult topics. Now, I think this is especially true of pastors and elders, and I think so does the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 9. After listing all those characteristics, here's what Paul says. He, the, the elder, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may, notice there's two things, one positive and one negative, so that he may be able to positively give instruction to sound doctrine and negatively to rebuke those who contradict it. Now, I, I keep hearing more and more people say, and I, I don't doubt them when they do. I think it's true. But I regularly hear people say, oh, I'm not good with conflict. I don't think anybody's necessarily good with conflict. 
I mean, if we're being honest, nobody likes to have those conversations. Nobody likes tension. Some people may be more averse to it than others. But nobody likes to have those hard conversations. And we're also in a culture where tolerance is a virtue, where we don't want to judge, where we've privatized everything. So you do what you're going to do. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So these, those conversations even lack availability or ability to even engage with them. So it's one thing if we're just going to lead a study on God's Word and talk about what is true. It's a whole other thing when you have to sit across from somebody, somebody you know, somebody you may be known for 10, 15 years, and you've got to have a hard conversation. Now, in this text, clearly Paul is saying that a pastor elder in that office is supposed to not only teach what is right and true, but look at the phrase there, must be able to rebuke those who contradict it. And then he kind of explains why in that first half of verse 10. For there are many, and man, I wish he would have said there are a few, or there are once in a while one that will pop up. But he used the word many. For there are many who are, here are the phrases, insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers. What does he mean by those? Like if we could click on that as like a hyperlink. What is Paul talking about? Brothers and sisters, it is hard in church to have hard talks. Everybody loves the priestly role of a pastor when they're by your bedside or they're officiating a funeral or they're with you taking a call after a doctor's report. And rightly so, pastors and elders should serve in that capacity. But there's a Beyond the priestly role, there's a prophetic role, not foretelling, but forthtelling, rebuking, having hard conversations that are less enjoyed. John Calvin says it this way, a pastor needs two voices, one for gathering sheep and the other for driving away wolves. And it's pretty hard to have two voices at the same time. But if we're actually caring for a flock... We're not only want to welcomely, lovingly gather the sheep and care for them in a priestly way, but we also want to make sure that we don't just allow that wolf to sleep right next to him and partake in the flock. Like sometimes you have to have those hard conversations. And we need to know that ultimately that kind of conversation isn't just going to happen by pastors and elders. It's going to be the sheep themselves, who will hear a level of insubordination toward the Lord, toward the authorities put over them, that, that will hear kind of empty talk, or even a distortion of the truth and what is right and good that could so damage the sheep that they themselves, maybe not shepherds or under shepherds of Christ, they want to speak into that. They want that to be cleaned away because they care about a healthy church. In fact, if we're really loving God, loving neighbor, and loving one another, we will address that. And we're not just addressing that because everybody who becomes that way or acts that way is a wolf. But sometimes for their own sake, we need to have those hard conversations. Again, we are in an age where it is much easier for us and seemingly allowable for us to say, well, that's on them. Well, actually, brothers and sisters, it's kind of on us too. We've got to be willing to have some of those hard conversations if we want a clean and healthy church. Last thing, and this is verses, middle of verse 10 all the way to the end, but related to what we just spoke about, a clean church will teach what is biblical and confront lies and disobedience. Paul gives numerous examples of this, but he starts with something called the circumcision party. Circumcision was a ceremonial symbol in the old covenant that was specifically for the nation of Israel. And ultimately in the new covenant, circumcision was eclipsed or replaced because it was no longer a symbol of one national identity, but, but all people or children of God the Father, all are adopted through Jesus Christ. But there were still some who were wanting to make new covenant Christians follow old covenant commands that God had rightly fulfilled through Christ. So in this church, that needed to be confronted. And it was very common in the early church for these confusions. The old covenant had just passed away. The new covenant had just begun. And it was hard to know how to separate the two. 
But there are going to be other things that Paul alludes to, even in these verses, threats to the gospel that must be addressed. Let me give you a few and reflect on them from these verses. There can be a distortion of Christianity that smacks of prosperity or personal gain. Verse 11 speaks that way when it talks about teaching for shameful gain. They can be so tempting to syncretize, combine together some kind of American dream Christian gospel hybrid that actually distorts the gospel. Where God somehow becomes my genie, my cosmic therapist and divine butler. There can be a distortion of Christianity that is influenced by this world. I think that's what verses, verse 12 is talking about, about the, the cultural practices of the Cretans. There's a lot of isms in the air that we want to be careful that we rightly think biblically about all things. There can be an influence of people who are not sound in the faith. I think verse 14 is saying this, where Paul says, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. That there's there's a huge influence. And now with, with access to online or TV and other resources and media, there can be a lot of different teachers that speak into our life. Some of those need to be checked and verified according to the truth. There can be a mixture of impure things with the gospel. I think that's what verse 15 is alluding to about purity and then yet things defiled. Or even, how about this, the end of verse 16. A faith in works that lacks or denies itself in deeds. Paul says, powerful statement at the start of verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. Said another way, in their, with their words, they talk as if they're affiliated with Jesus in full. But their actions give a fully different testimony. These are the things that a clean church, a healthy church, will seek to address. And here Paul speaks about that. We put things in order. We make the main things the main things. We make sure that all that we're doing fits what we as a church are designed to do. We establish a structure of pastors and elders to serve as overseers and caretakers for God's flock. We make sure that these individuals are of the right quality and caliber because their role is foundational to the structure and that there's a plurality of them so that they themselves have a check and balance even with a congregational government. We're willing to have hard conversations. We'll talk about things. We'll talk to one another. We'll actually love one another, not just like, well, that's on you. Would you do that to your kids? Would you do that to your sister? Why would you do that to your, someone in the family of God? Talk to them. Extend the gospel. Remind them of what is true. And we're willing to address hard things. We'll have conversations in this church that help us think about all the isms and all the cultural impact and how to think biblically about everything. And if we do that, then maybe, maybe we're starting to look healthy. Maybe we're taking what is there and it's cleaning it up. And it may not be a revival as only God can do, but there's a revitalization that's happening to make a church healthy. Well, Paul ends with a statement in, of rebuke to those that need to be confronted, but I wonder if it could be reversed. Paul says this at the very last few words of our text. He says, they are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for any good work. Imagine those people just allowed to roam freely among the sheep and never have it addressed. Imagine those truths taught and floated around and never spoken to. Imagine trying to walk in a room, not with clothes on the floor, but a dresser drawer. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Put the dresser drawer in the dresser. Make sure that what is true is presented. Make sure that the structure has got good materials. Make sure that there's a plurality so that no ego or power can run the day. Make sure that we're not afraid to have hard conversations because we love people and we're worried about them. And make sure that we're not afraid to talk about hard issues because it's a complex world. And God is a gracious God that wants us to think biblically about everything. So I'm gonna pray for Hope Evangelical Free Church as I close our message today. And I'm gonna pray that God will make us a clean church 
in contrast to what, how verse 16 ends, that we would be honorable, that we would be obedient, and that we would be fit for good works. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the way that you care about our church, not just the church in Crete, not just their pastor elders, but you care about Hope Evangelical Free Church. And Father, I pray that you would, even though with, with, with fear and trembling we say these words, we pray that you would put this church into order in any area or any way it is lacking so. That you would strike against what is untrue, where there is pride, where there is sin, where there's any sign of unhealth. Father, would you by your grace and mercy purge it from our midst? And help us to be a church that is clean and healthy. Father, thank you for the provision you've given to this church for many years. And for your sake, your glory, Father, for the good of this family of God, and even for our mission to the community, we ask for you to help us to be a clean church. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.